Have you guys heard of Uri Tuchman? He is an absolutely insane German artist who combines top-notch craftsmanship with an amazing sense of humor to make really great YouTube videos. He's made a model of himself, a handsaw that you grip by shaking its hand, and a bunch of other beautiful, whimsical creations. I have admired his work for years, and I've always wanted to do something with him. But to be honest, I was a little intimidated to approach him. But then, a couple months ago, he left a really nice comment on one of my videos. And like a tiger, I pounced on the man and said, hey, let's do a collaboration. And you know, look, Uri, he's got a pretty big channel, he gets a lot of attention, he doesn't have to do anything with me. But, well, he's too polite to say no. So, all of a sudden, I found myself working with one of my favorite creators, mostly just because I asked. That's how I got you, Uri. I used your own good manners against you. Oh, and we're going to make a turning saw together. This is a tool making video, not a video about how to manipulate people into working with you. Although, now that I think about it, those are both totally legitimate skills. Okay, a turning saw is like a giant version of a coping saw. It's got a very thin blade and handles that rotate so that you can point the blade in any direction as you work. How is this better than a plain old coping saw? Well, the blade is twice as long, so you get a longer stroke, and the wooden frame is heavier, which gives you more inertia in the cut. And this thing has European frame saw construction, so the tension is easy to adjust, and you can get that blade really tight. I honestly hate coping saws, and I've wanted to make a turning saw for a long time. And a couple of months ago, I was having breakfast at the home of a tool collector I know, and what did I see hanging up on the wall? This lovely example was made by the collector's grandfather some years ago, and he made it out of solid ebony. I immediately loved it. The clean lines, the elegant simplicity, this is a tool for a craftsman. So I snapped a picture. And I knew Uri was working on his part of the project, but honestly, I got busy and I kind of forgot about it. Until one day, I got a package in the mail from Germany. And these were inside. Not only can Uri paint and carve and engrave metal, he recently built himself a lathe, which I can only assume is how he made these absurdly beautiful handles, complete with carved details, brass pins, and, oh, our logos stamped into the end of each handle. But that's fine. I'm not bothered by his precision turnings or his delicately executed decorations. My part of this project will be just as good. I started with my photograph of the original saw traced it in Photoshop, and then moved it over to SketchUp, where I could measure it and figure out all the curves and details. I wanted to make a pretty faithful replica, and that's not easy when you're working from a quick snapshot that you took over breakfast. Then, I went to paper and drafting tools. Obviously, I could have just printed out the stuff I did in the computer, but I wanted to work full size and get a feel for the curves and proportions of the tool. I used a drafting square for the lines, a compass for the curves, and some stuff I just did freehand. I love digital design, but when you're going to make something you plan on holding in your hand day after day, you might just have to sit down and draw the damn thing. I transferred the paper template to wood. I'm not exactly sure which wood this is. It looks a bit like oak, but it's much heavier and denser. I don't have any ebony sitting around, so I just chose the densest wood I own. With all these curves, it's easy to think that you have to own a turning saw to make a turning saw, but you can handle all these curves with just a couple of chisels and a mallet. Inside curves seem especially tricky, but it just takes a little practice to learn how to ride the bevel and carefully scoop out material while leaving a flat surface behind. Outside curves are even easier because there's less risk of splitting and you can really just knock off material. Right now, a lot of people are wondering why I don't just put this thing on the bandsaw and cut it out. Well, I don't know what wood this is and I want to understand it better. Slowly carving out these details teaches me that this wood is dense and very hard but that it also has a waxy texture. It's not oak, but it is an open poured wood, and that makes it easy to split. Anytime you're working into end grain, you have to be pretty careful. To get these tight curves across the ends, I switch to abrasives. A big metal file and a sanding stick give me a fair curve and a smooth surface, even across the delicate end fibers. By the time I'm done roughing out this arm, I've got a solid understanding of this wood and how it behaves. I would never get that from just running it through a machine. Now. I understand my material, and I'm working on a deadline. So I rough out the second arm on the bandsaw. It's a lot faster, 
But when you put the two pieces side by side, they look awfully similar. It's easy to take off the saw marks and the chisel marks with a spoke shave and a bit of sandpaper. Now that I've got the main components assembled, I can bring in the hardware. And here's where we ran into some problems. Uri is from Germany. And of course, he made his handles to take saw blades in the European style. The blade would have a hole in it and would be held in place by these little brass pins. Uri even pinned one side of each pin into a mushroom shape so they can't fall through the holes. The only problem is that I can't get that kind of blade here in the US. The blades I have are a bit smaller and they've got the pins built in. My blades are just the wrong size and style. We talked it over and he agreed that I should just modify his hardware. Uri left plenty of extra material on the brass pins, so I just saw off his holes, saw that central slit a bit deeper, and then add a diagonal saw cut to grab the pins on my blades. And all of that went fine. Did you even notice how I cleverly stuck the pins into a hole in this little undersized block of wood? That let me hold it steady while I did all those operations. The only problem was I made this hole a little bit too tight and I couldn't pull the pins back out when I was done. No problem, no problem. I just took a bolt, stuck it through the other end, and tapped that pin out. And promptly snapped the end right off of it. Well, I guess this is why I keep a box of brass in the shop. Uri's piece threads into the wood handle, so I set up to cut threads in my leg vise, which turns out to be a completely stupid idea. And I move the whole thing over to the other side of my shop, where I've got a proper machinist spice, soft jaws, a V-block, and, you know, the actual correct tools for the job. I do the threads first, in case I have to saw them off and start over. Then I cut to length, deburr the end, and then cut and shape the notch. Uri's knob threads right on, and I add a dash of CA glue, just for insurance. Through the magic of editing, it looks like I made this part quickly, but I did not. The frame needs a little bit of resizing for the shorter pin, but there's still plenty of wood there. Now, before I go any further, I need to take these half-finished parts and make sure they're actually going to function. Testing is a crucial part of prototyping. This actually isn't the first frame saw I ever made. Last year, I spent two days making a larger version with beautiful components, flowing curves, and very, very thin details. And then, after two days of work, I got the whole thing together and realized I had made it so delicate it wasn't stiff enough to handle tension, and the whole thing just went into the burn pile. What you really want to do on a project like this is do the bare minimum amount of work, then get your components assembled and make sure they function. It's okay to learn this lesson the hard way, but you really want to try and learn it the first time. My arms and handles are all set, so I've cut a temporary stretcher out of pine and made a quick tensioning device out of a couple of rubber bands. The biggest thing here is to find the exact length for that stretcher. That's a crucial dimension for the finished product. Once I got the temporary stretcher at the exact length, I cut another piece of my mystery hardwood and carefully trimmed it to exactly match my test piece. Of course, the actual stretcher needs tenons on the end to hold it into the arms, so by making an exact copy of my temporary stretcher, I made this piece too short. And this is also my last piece of mystery hardwood. So uh, I think red oak, red oak would make an excellent stretcher, so we're gonna go with that. Here's the correct stretcher with just a little bit of extra length on either side. I won't be needing that other piece anymore, and I can get on to trimming up the new piece and cutting the joints. These are precise little tenons, so I'm going with my finest saw and taking each step slowly and carefully. There have already been enough screw-ups on this project. The final tenon gets careful paring along the shoulders. I don't want any gaps on a fine tool like this. The mortises in the arms are just like furniture mortises, only smaller and shallower. They don't take very long to chop with a small chisel. You might be thinking that you want a turning saw, but you're not ready to tackle all this joinery just yet. No problem. In a couple of weeks, I'll have the Woodwork for Humans version of this saw, made with off-the-shelf hardware and easy joinery, and it'll be dirt cheap. Once the mortises are chopped, they still need a bit of cleanup, but the tenon slides right home and the shoulders are tight. Now that all the parts are made, I need a real tensioning system. This nylon string should be durable. I've also got this little toggle, which is just a small slat of maple. It allows you to tension the string and then braces against the stretcher to keep it from unwinding. The whole thing's together, so let's go ahead and test it right now. I want to cut a tight curve in this board. Going down one side is easy, and when my saw hits the bench top, I can just rotate the handles 90 degrees, and now my saw teeth are pointing in a perfect direction to finish this shape. 
This is the first time I've ever used a turning saw, and that's a pretty great little curve for a first try. I'm really excited about how this tool works, but there's still a lot of cleanup and smoothing that needs to be done before I'm finished. Historically, these tools were often very elegant. They were a mark of a craftsman's skill. I don't want mine to be anything less. So I'll be honest, this was a challenging build. I made a lot of mistakes, there were a lot of setbacks, and all these problems were just made worse by the fact that I was working with somebody who I really admire, and his part of the project came out beautifully. I really I wanted mine to measure up, I wanted it to be just as good. But you know, I've done a few of these collaborations, and I always have to remind myself, it's not a competition. It's two people working together, and they don't have to be doing things at the exact same level or have the same skills. When you have a tool like this, even something that's really beautiful, the whole thing doesn't have to be incredibly decorative. I can just let Uri's parts be the really decorative, fancy, super beautifully detailed parts. And my parts can be more about the big picture, proportion, and curves, and a nice finish. And the two things come together to make a whole that maybe is better than either one of us could have done separately. That is kind of the whole point. And also, the tool just works beautifully. You can cut any curve you want with this thing. A big, long, flowing curve or a very tight, small, detailed curve. This is a really useful tool in the shop. Oh, and Uri built in another fantastic detail. A lot of the time, when you're woodworking, you might need a marking knife, and you might think, oh shoot, where is it, where did I put it? Oh, well, you don't need to worry about that, because he built one in. Just give that big handle a twist, and you can pull out this really nicely made little marking knife that'll handle any little line or detail you need to scribe, or if you need to shiv somebody in the hallway, you can do that too. It's all here. Now you might be thinking, that is a very nice saw. I would like to own a saw like that. Well, you can own this one. Uri and I are auctioning this one off to benefit St. Jude Children's Hospital. We're doing an eBay auction with no reserve. It goes to the highest bidder. So go ahead and click the link down in the description and put in a bid and maybe this thing can be yours. All the proceeds are gonna go to charity. And just like always, I have to thank my patrons on Patreon. They give me the support to tackle big, ambitious projects like this and put in the time that I would never be able to put in otherwise. If you'd like to be one of those people, go on over to patreon.com slash Rex Kruger and check out the early access and rewards that I have just for the people who make these videos possible. Oh, and thanks a lot to Uri. It was great to work with him on this and I'm really happy with the final project. I'm going to be back next week with something just as good, but maybe a little bit more low stress. I hope to see you there. Thanks for watching.